Live from our studios, just steps from the fabulous Las Vegas Strip, it's The Business Lounge with your host, David Wright. Hi, I'm your host, David Wright. Welcome to The Business Lounge, where we talk to real people about real business and real success. I am excited today. Today, I have half of the dynamic duo of the Ali brothers, Jerome Ali. But before I introduce him, I just would like to talk a little bit about some of the credentials they have. Like, they've played with Carlos Santana, George Clinton, Parliament, Ray Charles, Natalie Cole, Earl Clue, Buddy Miles, the Doobie Brothers, just to name a few. So these are serious brothers that get down to serious business when it comes to music. And they were also voted the best jazz group at the American Black Music Awards in 2008. So with that, I'd like to welcome Jerome to the show. Jerome, thank you, thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me, David. Thank you. So I, I, I did a little research because I, I, I've seen you around town. I mean, I've seen you at various places around town, and uh, I've introduced myself to uh, your lovely wife and yourself, and you guys are always busy, focused on the business of music. So, sure. uh, But I did not know that you basically are from Motor City, Detroit. Yes, yes, Motown. <laughs> so you grew up during the era where Motown was really just starting to exercise a little muscle. Yes. Uh, that had to have been a very interesting period of time. Uh, tell the audience a little bit of what that was like for you. Well, growing up in, in Detroit, is, it, was, it was a great time. Life was just simple. Uh, we had wonderful uh, musicians, uh, great music, great venues where musicians can go and perform, and great acts like Marvin Gaye, uh, Tammy Terrell, uh, gosh, uh, you name it, uh, just the whole Motown crew. Uh, I, you know, uh, I think I also read that your father was a musician. Is that, is that where the talent pool begins? Yes, he was somewhat a jazz pianist when he was in the service and, uh, you know, at home and, you know, from time to time. And as time went on, he decided to just let it go. And I guess he wanted the music to filter through Jimmy and myself. So, and okay. it turned out okay. okay. As I uh, look at that and uh, I think about all the things that kids can get involved with, you know, a lot of times we hear so much about kids getting involved with sports and uh, the like. What made you decide to pick up the guitar? Well, initially, our parents wanted us to be musicians. Jimmy, my brother, wanted to actually play drums. Myself, I actually wanted to play saxophone. <laughs> I was, uh, my father played a lot of jazz music around the house, uh, Charlie Parker, uh, Eddie Harris, I was a big fan of both of those guys. And I really wanted to play saxophone. So, but they, they were like, no, you guys, you're gonna play uh, guitar. Jimmy actually played classical guitar just as well in the okay. beginning. He switched over to the bass a little later on, you know, because we, we were talking one summer and it was like, somebody's gotta play bass, so. <laughs> and it, it was him. He felt that I was a better guitar player. If he was here, he would probably say that. You know, but it, it worked out okay. Okay. Uh, so as you were going through your paces in Detroit, what made you decide to look at Las Vegas as a place to expand your wings or to grow your talent? Well, initially coming out to Las Vegas was really predicated on my wife's health and my health too at that time because she was diagnosed with uh, sarcoidosis. But the music was also in the background just as well. So, but we made that, that transition and that move here predicated on that alone. But when we got out here and we saw what was happening musically, uh, back in the, the, the late 90s, you can pretty much walk in any venue here in Las Vegas and, and start working with any, any act. You know, and Vegas was actually, the big boom was still happening at that time. So if you look at that uh, and contrast that to what we see today, and I, and I often know that just like any other industry, uh, music has its ups and downs. So talk a little bit about the struggles you've faced uh, recently. 
what's going on now, I think, in Vegas is more, and not only in Vegas, just in the music industry, period, is that it's more of an image that they're selling now. Uh, the kids today, they're not really focusing on, you know, like music back when I was coming up. And even before our time, you used to be able to go to school and you, you have some kind of curriculum where you can go and learn violin, flute, you know, uh, cello or piano or drums or guitar or vocal or whatever. Now it's, it's everything is so, com it's all commercial and computerized and it's predicated on just those things alone. Uh, you're not getting really the reality, what kids should be really getting in reality is somewhere where they can go and be taught. Like in school, you can, if, if you were in school still and they had those curriculums for the kids in school, mm -hmm. you don't have that anymore. So I think we suffer and uh, you, you're not developing the person's mind musically. Now, that, that's interesting because a, a lot of the contention in the music industry today is over who sampled whose song or yes. who wrote what uh, melody first or it's too similar to another uh, uh, melody. Uh, have you done uh, original works? Do you have a catalog of original works? Yes. Or do you have, oh, so yes. let's talk about those original yes. works. Um, Jimmy and I, we, we compose most of the things we, we've done so far, and we're working on that now. Uh, we've been working on some of the music that uh, that we hope to have out soon. Um, we have some great performers that, that's part of our CD project. We have the Perry Sisters, we have Russell Ferrante, which is the uh, founder of the Yellow Jacket okay. uh, the jazz band. Uh, we have Dennis Chambers, which is the drummer of, was at one time, with Carlos Santana. Um, uh, Eric Mirathal, saxophonist for Chick Corea, uh, just a whole host of wonderful people. Will Kennedy, he's the drummer for the Yellow Jackets uh, also. Dennis Chambers, I mentioned him, but he, I, I need to let people know that he's a drummer. All right. You know, in case you didn't know. Uh, and, no, that, um, that, that, no that's, a, that's good because I think uh, so many times uh, people especially young people have this idea that they are going to go and they are going to write or play a song that out of the garage, out of the basement, out of the living room, and they're going to receive instant notoriety or success. Uh, talk about that journey from where you uh, have come to to now where you're saying, I can create my own and I feel confident and strong enough that this project will stand on its own. Well, that's a good question and a uh, good, good point. Um, growing up, I mean, you, you have these uh, influences that you have that cultivate and develop your musical talents or your voice, so to speak. Um, and it helps develop you and then you get to that point somewhere in your musical understanding that you will be able to uh, compose and write your own compositions. So um, I feel as though Jimmy and I, we've, we're still learning. You will always learn, you know, and you, uh, we've come to a point where we're now we're composing our own songs and uh, we're trying to get those compositions completed and hopefully get it out to the public. I know it's very difficult to, uh, because it's costly, studio time's costly, marketing's costly, uh, and the like, uh, but if you were going to choose uh, a single live performance that you would say would be the highlight, not the pinnacle, because that's yet to be achieved, because as far as I know, you're still living, so there's, yes. there's still uh, an opportunity to, to go beyond uh, what you've currently achieved, but what, what would be like a major highlight? Uh, in your career? Probably doing, uh, maybe getting the opportunity to go over to, to Paris or Japan and perform at one of the, the, the pro, their, their venues, one of their, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can't think of what I'm trying to say here. No, that's fine. Uh, you know, the, the thing is, so, so many times, uh, I think you touched on it a little bit. When I was in school, 
just like you were in school, uh, from grade school up through uh, basically high school, music was a requirement. I mean, in grade school, you uh, learned a little xylophone thing, you learned the uh, thing that you strum, then you push the little sure. chords down. Absolutely. Uh, you were in choir or chorus or, you know, it, it was mandatory. Do you think that that would really help young people today? Because uh, from uh, the studies that I've read, uh, that music is math. Yes. Uh, because of the timing, tempos, changes. Uh, and so those children uh, that are musical are also very good at math. Yes, I think that's, that's, that would help. Music does help. Math and music actually go, goes hand in hand. You know, uh, Scott and I were talking a little uh, earlier and, uh, <laughs> you know, he said, well, do you know about Take Five? Because we were talking about the Brubrecht brothers were just here. Yes. And uh, he says, do you know what that means? And I said, it's only one or two things. It's either the, the fifth note in the chord structure or it's timing. He said, no, it's timing. And yeah. so he goes on to explain that. And I think that's the thing that people don't understand, that you constantly have to exercise your brain mathematically. Over time, it becomes easier, but it really does develop the brain strong. If you were going to give one young person, say, say somebody who's just looking at getting started in music, what advice would you give them? Let's take a theory class. Go get an instructor so you can get the, the basic fundamentals of it so you can understand the principles. You know, basic, you know, the harmony, the theory, the rhythm of it all. So, you know, that at least get some kind of foundation. I mean, you got great musicians like Wes Montgomery that was, you know, self-taught, you know, that, um, that he changed the whole scope of, of you know, j jazz guitar in the 60s. I mean, you have great guys now. I mean, you have Pat Metheny and Pat Martino, which is still, we still have him. He's, he's one of the great pioneers, you know. And then you have some of the great pianists, uh, uh, Bill Evans and uh, Keith Jarrett, you know, McCoy Tyner, you know. So, I mean, you know, it's, you, you, you need some kind of a foundation. It's one thing to, to, to learn by ear, and that's how we learn from the beginning anyways. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you go uh, pick up an instrument and you noodle around on it, it's not that you know the, the, the paratechnics of it and the mechanics mm -hmm. of it. What you're doing is trying to emulate something that you heard. Right. You know, so um, th that's, that's the fun thing about it. And music is supposed to be fun. That's the whole, whole thing. It's not, if some people take the music part of it too serious. You know, the beginning of it, you have to ask yourself, well, why did I play in the beginning in the first place? Or why did I choose this instrument? Because either you, you fell in love with it, it was your toy, and you played with it, and, but you learn, you know, the, the fundamentals of it, and then eventually as life goes on and you keep pursuing it, you, you, you blossom into something beautiful, hopefully. You know, well, maybe that's why I ended up being an engineer and not a bassist <laughs> down the road. <laughs> the beautiful just wasn't coming. <laughs> Don't say that. You're great. You're great. <laughs> hey, no, no comments over from the peanut gallery, please. So, yeah, we, you know, that, that's the thing that I think so much of the time is that we've taken the fun out of education. It's all about getting the grades, making yes. the numbers, making the teachers yes. look good and the school look good. Uh, I know that uh, there are things on the horizon uh, for you if, I won't say five years because five years always seems like such a long time today, but if you are looking at one or two years down the road, uh, what would you be doing differently then than you are today? That's a profound question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I hope to keep heading in the same direction, progressing, learning, growth process, and um, hopefully uh, we'll have some music out uh, by then, and um, hopefully the public is ready for it. You know, the world is ready for it, because I know it's, it's difficult, as I said earlier, that uh, you're, you're dealing with uh, an image. They're selling images now, man, self-made images. It's not anything to do with... Uh, what's 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 uh, given 
you know, as uh, far as a gift, uh, musicians, whether it be male or female, having that gift to, to play. But there's so many great musicians out there that, that's not even heard of. You know, um, and, and whether they be male or female, great talent. I get on the internet, I see some of these young kids, they should be heard. There's a yeah. whole generation of folks like ourselves that just got, just skipped over completely. Yeah. You know, when they brought in the, the I, I love the technology part of things, but I mean, you, you're taking away from what's, what's internal, you need to internalize some of these things musically. You know, that's why I mentioned about going to get you an instructor, mm -hmm. internalize, you know, some of, you know, the, the language of music. Music is a universal language. You know, I, I uh, when I uh, think back to uh, growing up as a kid uh, and listening to the radio, uh, we, we would get a skip because where I'm from, Minneapolis, uh, didn't have a, a real uh, soul station until I was like 16 or 17 years old. <laughs> so you'd get a skip out of Kansas City or a sure. super station out of uh, uh, Chicago and you'd stay up late at night hoping that you could hear this unique sound because right. it moved you, that you had this emotion uh, that really made you think that all things are possible, whatever that was, whether, you know, I basically got involved with music because I thought I could get girls to being in a band. I mean, I'll, <laughs> I'll be honest, that's what I did. <laughs> Hey, music? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, but, but I think um, when you think about the pieces I missed, I could learn to play a song, but I didn't understand really what I was playing. It was just, uh, you know, you spend 10,000 hours doing something pretty soon, you should be able to, to, to play it. But uh, I think it's what you touched on was key, is really grabbing a hold of that emotion. That, sure. that moves people and really changes their lives. Right. Uh, where can people find out more about where you're going uh, to be performing uh, in the future, or where can they just find out how they can get out there and hire you? We're uh, on Facebook. Uh, we have a website. It's www.thebrothersali.com. And uh, go there. We have videos. Um, the information is there for contact. Uh, you can actually uh, give us a call. We have phone number 702-837-4353. Uh, um, you can ask to speak to my wife Evelyn Ali. She handles uh, most of our business. So um, also we work through an agency, Steve Byers Productions. Uh, you can contact, you can go to his website and we do events for them just as well. And they're great folks. We love those people. They, they, they stood by us for years. And they're still standing by us. And they're great. So, so we, you know, we, we're still working on it. All right. We're still working on it. <laughs> Jerome, thank you for being on the show. Uh, thank you, been, David. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This is Dave Wright from the Business Lounge, where we talk to real people about real business and real success. Until the next time, be blessed.